Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry it was in Spanish, but I was just asked by uh, Klaus to have my curriculum so I could improvise our translation. Thank you, Klaus, for the invitation. And it's pity here is not Professor Pitchman who really paved the way for me to be today here. So thank you for your presence. So let's start. Cataloging, an activity frequently looked down on by researchers, has been, personally speaking, a source of continual learning and of quite surprising discoveries. Perhaps what caught my attention most was saying how the concept of cathedral splendor, frequently ascribed to the Mexico City Cathedral, based on the music written, performed, and preserved both in and for the cathedral, was turned into a historical myth, commonplace of Hispano American musicology. What has been catalogued in terms of both music manuscripts and also choir books contradicts this concept. The splendor is observed neither in quantity nor quality, above all when viewed through a 19th century Central European lens. No great works nor famed composers emerge. Neither do any great quantities of music of any specific genre or style. On the contrary, the long historical voids locked in years in which no works were produced, as well as the lack of local and imported production, are surprising. <clears throat> From 1532 to 1660, there are no traces of music in manuscripts. Music saved from this period is found in choir books. In the music archive, the oldest work is El Audate Dominum by Francisco López Capillas, dated in circa 1660. And the most recent are the Vespers for Corpus Christi by Delfino Madrigal, dated 1973. We have 4,404 individual works and collections. This figure is sometimes misleading, some, somewhat misleading, if we observe that 514 are by Antonio Juanas, <clears throat> 260 are antiphons written in a square notation in the second half of the 19th century, and there are 369 salon dances. For what was the Metropolitan Cathedral of the Viceroyalty of New Spain, and the cathedral of one of the largest countries in Latin America, I don't consider these figures to be splendid. <clears throat> As an overview, I shall mention some factors which, in my opinion, contextualized and explained the above. Music was necessary for celebrating the Catholic liturgy, and this need governed the interest of, in music of the chapter of the Cathedral of Mexico. It seems to have been the norm to have the bare minimum in terms of musicians, instruments and repertoire with the sole purpose of fulfilling their canonical obligation and nothing more. From Juan Juarez, circa 1539, to Antonio Salazar, who died in 1715, musical resources, thus men, works, traditions of what to do and how to do it, were received from the mother country, passed on and to a small degree, enriched from generation to generation. The establishment of the Colegio de Infantes in 1725 was attributed more to concerns of prestige for its founders and of moral and discipline for the choir books and choristers than to quantitative and qualitative reasons relating to musical activity within the cathedral. Antonio de Salazar, who amongst others instructed Manuel de Sumaya, was in fact the last chapel master to form musicians until 1838, the year in which the position was dissolved. Sumaya and the chapel masters after him neither educated students nor created academy. Their legacy was limited to written music. Prolonged periods of vacancy are proof of this. Pursuant to royal patronage, for 300 years, the Church of New Spain was subject to both the crown 
and the Council of Indies for nominations and appointments of chapter members and chapel masters and to the Peninsular Monopolies for the importation of printed and handwritten music. Their inclusion within the Hispanic world's realm of cathedrals, characterized by homogeneity of repertoire and musical activity, was a true reflection of the global context. Under the domains of the Spanish Empire, the implementation of the Catholic religion was the stated purpose of its invasions and wars of conquest. The ideology which emanated from it, the most efficient means of control, and the cathedrals, some of the institutions in which imperial power was completely exercised and accepted. Therefore, it was mandatory to follow the canon and to avoid innovation. By the same token, any display of acculturation of the music used in the cathedral's ritual was unthinkable contrasting to other areas where, in the initial years of the colony, expressions that were hitherto unheard of reflected the reality of a multicultural and diverse colony. In this regard, it is worthwhile pointing out that the folklorizing or exotic interpretation of paraliturgical villancicos, which were written for the cathedral, becomes a construct, constructor of authorship of its proposer. Extraneous, I would go as far as saying contrary, to a historical informed performance. From the signing of the Act of Independence in 1824, and now without royal patronage or a leader to depend on, the musical resources of the Mexico City Cathedral were no longer being replenished. They became stereoty stereotyped and deteriorated to the point of remaining exanimate. The quality of the music written in the post-independence years <clears throat> and the large quantity of contrafacts from the 19th century are strong indicators of this. <clears throat> During 300 years of colonization, it was impossible for any music chapel outside that of the cathedral to survive, given that the viceregal court was an unstable entity, which changed with every viceroy and the nobility of New Spain, an oligarchy made of, up of individuals with histories, lineages, and fortunes from the diverse and very heterogeneous backgrounds. A nobility with extravagant tastes, lovers of ostentation, of entertainment, <coughs> like bullfights, ritual of public penances, tournaments, who acquired and boasted of large expanses of land, small palaces, and luxury items from all parts of the world. For that nobility, music appears to have had a far inferior cultural value to that of painting according to what is shown in their inventories and testaments. So you can see the born, the native born painters and musicians, vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, but they take the, between painters and muses, chapel masters and music. There are no records of music chapels being supported by any of these noblemen. Viceregal institutions, brotherhoods, and members of the nobility turned to the cathedral's musicians for occasional services. These occasional services had to be managed and regulated by the cathedral itself, given that this made up the insufficient salary paid to the musicians once they were accepted into the chapel. Any personal initiative was penalized. The musicians were servants of the chapel and had to act as such. Furthermore, the cathedral walls provided them with social protection, making it unnecessary for them to belong to a guild, which was the only chance the subjects had to live in with a quorum in a corporate society. The guild enforced competition between peers. It generated meritocracy and forced its members into regular updating and professional growth in order to attract clients. Once hired, 
the musician from the cathedral's chapel did not have to compete or make any effort to improve himself. A large part of the works found in the repertoire today can be characterized by both mundane and mediocre. From 1810 to 1973, Mexico lived through three revolutions. It was invaded six times. It lost half of its territory. It had provisional governments, triumvirates, and regencies. It was an empire twice. It had two dictators. On several occasions, it moved from federalism to centralism and from Catholicism to secularism, including religious persecution. Both the specific context of the music from the Mexico City Cathedral and the macro history of the country, which I have briefly touched upon, are reflected in the manuscripts, and it is of this that works and documents speak. There is an equation that proves its validity almost on a daily basis. The less interesting the music content, the more interesting the historical and cultural aspects they reflect turn out to be. There are works and documentary items that have created a real cataloging challenges and for which we were unable to find an answer in RISM's protocol, the by way we follow from the beginning as well as forcing us to think about concepts such as work, authorship, creation, reproduction, emission, execution, and so forth. It can be deducted from the above, I believe, that we may be able to contribute some new solutions to the discipline in cataloging music manuscripts, which could be useful for cataloging similar files, <clears throat> namely, colonial or peripheral cathedral files, which furthermore were unable to preserve the historical integrity. Unlike choir books, paper manuscripts turn out to be of little interest to the viceroys, archbishops, generals, and presidents who pillaged the cathedral's treasure. Unquestionably, many of these papers were treated like ephemeral art, disposable, such as the Villancicos and Chansonetas, for example. In addition, throughout its long ex existence, the music archive experienced moments of neglect, giving rise to pilferage. In this regard, perhaps one of the darkest prolonged and damaging period was between 1967, when Stanford finished microfilming and cataloging the archive, and 1994 when Father Avila Blancas asked Salvador Valdez to send the papers and organize what existed. From 2006, when we started the Musicat project, we have found works which have been scattered around, incorrectly registered, missing, incomplete, lost, and so forth. There are three typographies which, have, which we have not found in RISM protocol, and which were uncovered and characterized in the Musicat project. Factitious collection, collection of collections, and sets, as well as the fields integration of the factitious collection and synopsis of the documentary unit. In addition, we have considered the proposal of a virtual set. I will briefly touch upon each one of them. Factitious collection. The concept addresses three aspects. The work's materiality, or how the document is presented, its liturgical musical content, and its executability, or the ability to, possibility to perform. Recourse for integrating a factitious collection stems from an understanding of the work document and takes into account the substantial changes to which the files organization has been subjected throughout centuries of use. One of the types of factitious collections we have put together is one in which the works, by having the same music but different texts, thus contrafacta, were located in different documentary units. In spite of the instrumental part being required from the original work in order to perform the, der the der derived works contrafactor. Here, 
you have sig different signatures, yeah? Those documents were apart. Now they are together. Whenever this happened, the work has been put together and cataloged as individual works, as individual works of collection, with due explanation of the works that have been derived from the original and of how the factitious collection has been integrated. This is one of the pantallas of our database. Uh, we have it now on, in the cloud, of Musicat Cloud. Here you have a field that we have to create, Collection Factitia, and here we discover how is it integrated, yes? Well, is that we have, a, of course, a protocol of how to write, and the syntax is whether comma or not comma, whether the old signature goes and so forth. So this is a special sign field we have to put in the register for factitious collection. The second item, has to do with collections of collections. This concept addresses two aspects, the materiality of the works document and their executability. This implies, this applies when there are one or several collections and one of several individual works in an individu indivisible documentary unit in which some works, generally vocal contrafacts, require instruments from the others for the performance. Subscript letters are added to the main catalog number in alphabetic order, following the order in which the, each of these of the integral collections and individual works are presented. Two sets of Martins by Antonio Juanas provide a simple case, a very simple case. <coughs> he wrote, for both voices and instruments, the invitatory hymn and eight responsories for the Feast of Corpus Christi. We cataloged it as A0134A. Afterwards, on the draft score for the Feast of St. John Baptist, which we catalog as A0134B, he noted, only the voices are written on this score, which are taken from the preceding responsories. For this reason, the same instruments are used and they are not copied again. That's the note he wrote. At the beginning, we catalog the two sets of Juanas as a factitious collection by origin, thus by author. With the benefit of insight, we realized that this cataloging had to be revised. So we did it after a starting file A1455. To date, the most complex of all the files we have found in the archive and the one for which it became necessary to create the typography collection of collections. Whilst we can determine its history and integration from the cover, you see the cover, neither are easy to decipher nor to understand. It does not appear in the catalog published by Stanford in 2002, even though he microfilmed, microfilmed the whole file, albeit in this array, identifying it through a separate sheet on which he wrote the catalog number previously assigned by Father Javier Gonzalez. In the listing included at the end of row 83, there is no parts inventory, but just the list of titles which appear on the cover. Salvador Valdez registered it like this and added his own enumeration. The false disorder made it absolute incomprehensible. Here you have. The first work of this, we put it, let's say, is A, is A1455A.1. A. Is a responsory to Espetrus, that is a third responsory for Matins of St. Peter, by Bustamante for two choirs, SATB, two violins, two clarinets, two coarse org, and a cam, with a recitative for bass and an andante for soprano. This work gave rise to the collection of collections. Bustamante's score cannot be found in the archives, and the work appears in parts copied by another man named Triuge. The voices for both choirs were the same, except for soprano one and bass one. There was one copy for each voice. 
the flute part was subsequently added by Tujeque. And the timpani by Carrillo, 50 years about after. Over the years, the parts for choir two were used for contrafacta and became parts of choir one afterwards. They were used as re recycled paper. In the process, paradoxically, the original work was left incomplete. Carrillo scrapped in the bass part the recitative for the bass soloist, and in the soprano's part, he deleted the verse of the third responsory tool, which was an andante for soprano soloist, replacing it with a wound from the eighth responsory. In this moment, he changed the genre because it was not anymore a responsory, it became a motet. Leaving the original work incomplete. This work has four sections. A grave, which is an instrumental introduction plus a recitative, in this case for bisol, an allegro, a tutti, the andante, which has a verse of the responsory, which was a soprano solo, a gloria patri, and a tutti, and several, one or several of all of these sections were used in the contrafacto interchangeably. So, Bustamante himself wrote from the complete work a contrafactum, Ego Sum Panis, which got the number A.2. Same music, different text, appearing only in vocal parts and which can be performed with the instrumental parts from the responsory to Espectrus, thus the point one. In the Ego Sum Panis Responsory, Triujeque added to all the vocal parts the text Quaes Ista Que Processit, the first responsory of the Assumption. You see there, added text. Yeah? But it had be, can be played with instruments of point one, yeah? and this is point two. Okay. Pilar Carrillo in 18, this is the data there, in 1897, used the four sections of Bustamante's work for a contrafactum which was titled Eighth Responsory of St. Peter. In fact, a motet, since he takes text from the third and the eighth responsory of that feast. As we have already witnessed, Carrillo used the part of Bustamante's work meant for Bissol. Yeah, there it is. He crossed out the recitative found at the beginning of the third responsory and added half a page. Here you have it in detail, yeah? Here's the crossing out, and here's the added page. With a recitative for soprano with the text taken from the eighth responsory. In the, sopra uh, yeah. in the soprano part, he deleted, here it comes here. You have there. He scrapped the original text, this Vilar Carrillo. He took the original part, scrapped the soprano, that it was the solo soprano, and he wrote another text from another responsory. Yeah? Here. That, that, therefore, it changed the genre. It's not more a responsory, it's a motive. Yeah? Uh, well, I'm lost here. Soprano's part. He deleted the text from the Andante, that was the verse of the third responsory by Bustamante, and overwrote the verse of the eighth responsory. There is how it <coughs> deleted and then we will review. Okay. In a booklet for bass or piano, he wrote the whole score for the whole work. Yep. Okay, okay, right. Okay, here. This mode can be performed with soprano and keyboard or with soprano and the instrumental parts of point one, of A point one. The first two sections of the parts of violin one and violin two from Bustamante's work were transcribed for clarinet one and clarinet two by Trujeque. The andante remained, but he didn't write it. They can be used to perform the contrafactum Point one, which is emoted in the, the contrafact 1455b.1, which is emoted for the procession of the Virgin. Here it goes emoted. An anonymous composer used 
two sections of Bustamante's work to make a contrafactum where the text Beata is being promoted for processions of the Blessed Mary. Yeah? Two choirs of SSTB with the voices of both choirs being equal, with the exception of the one as sole part, which has the recitative. Uh, Pilar Carrillo used this part as a draft for the quest for the text Quem Dicum Omnes. Here. Oh, it's the draft there. Okay. On the back of the part of choir two, now you see this is this is the front. Now you go, get this Virgo, an anonymous composer wrote the contrafactum Veni Santo Spiritus, again emoted. Processions for the Pentecostals, for ATP, using only the Allegro section. Now here comes a tremendous thing. In the parts of choir two, and you can see how it was crossed and put there one, that include the TB double viderunt eam pertaining to A.1, to Petrus and Qua Sesta, which firstly was used for quite one, and then most probably, as we can see, as reused paper, an anonymous composer wrote the contrafactum Illuminari Jerusalem, which is a gradual. Here, yeah, so this is the front and this is the back. So it's another work and another genre because it's a gradual. which firstly was used for This documentary unit is a wonderful example for portraying cataloging as an hermeneutic activity, given that the data registry itself does not facilitate the understanding of either a document or work, much less of a file. The paradox lies in the fact that in order to be able to catalog, it is necessary to know and to understand what is being catalogued. The chaos in which the file was found and the impossibility Stanford discovered of no longer cataloging, but simply of registering the works, sheets and authors which were contained in it are proof of this. On the other hand, few units proved to be so illuminating as this one for examining the historical context in which Mexico lived after the War of Independence, for verifying the dearth of inherited musical resources in the Metropolitan Cathedral, and for assessing the precariousness which affected its musical activity at the end of the 19th century. Set. Rizme throws up to 11 entries in the free search field when using the word set. It appears three times as part of the title, or the literally inch bit of a work one, one as a word in the text of observations, four times as a type of collections of the same genre, instrumental verses and psalms, and five times in the way we use it in musica, the grouping of works of different genres according to a specific liturgical service. However, The reason that OPAC does not appear to have systematization in this catalographic use, as observed when the word set is cross-matched with the genre column Schlagwort. The concept of set, whether Vespers, Matins, or Complines, raises a contradiction in terminus, given that in the strict sense of the word, it is a collection of individual works. However, yes, Can you please intermit? Oh, I'll try. However, the coherence and connections existing between them is a result of the liturgy and functions which is achieved within each one of these groups, of these words. Hence, we have chosen to consider this particular type of collection as a word, cataloging a framework which reflects the coherence and intentionality of the grouping of the works therein. The resulting record appears with its own catalog number for the whole set and through the use of decimals with a sub subordinate catalog <coughs> number for each of its individual works. Here you have one of these. And so I have to be brief. We have to see that in our OPA, you can consult it. There are 1,200 registers. I mean, 
mediums there or and journalists have used the OPEC uh, in, in the archive, yeah. We have it in three, well, here is the OPEC, you have the data generales, and you will see that there are all the recent categories and written. Here you have how it looks, and of course you can get inside any of the works by clicking, you open the individual work, yeah. And here you have what we have had to put, this synopsis de la unidad documental, which helps the user to navigate the document, yeah? Because otherwise you only have all these observations written here, written there, and you don't understand the whole thing of, the, of what had happened. Here in this, we make that Juan has made three contrafacta, that they, there is one piece which is from Rust, another, another person, so this is a, an example of multiple integration around 150 years, yes? It's not the work, one work of one author. It's a multiple integration and it needs to be explained. Otherwise, you are lost in the observation. That's what we thought it was necessary to put in. So I don't further explain. You can look at it in the OPAC if you want. Yes. So I only, I only, I also, virtual set is what actually the Craig Russell did when he published the, the Martins for the Virgin of Guadalupe or were uh, Chanticleer reported. They made a, a factitious set, so a virtual set. And we have been offering that in the matchings in the third volume of our catalog, the possibility of building virtual sets when in, um, inventory are apart from responsories. Those we don't want to make the factitious collections because we understand that Imna and, uh, and um, um, inventory were used for several sets of responsories and that was, they had to be put apart, yeah? Okay. So one colorful, some lines. In the Musicat project, we have discovered that accuracy in the application of cataloging criteria is essential, along with a certain amount of flexibility when carrying this out, whenever knowledge and understanding of works and documents are required. The decision of catalog according to genres was epistemic rather than, the, than musicological, musicology driven. Whatever knowledge can be contributed about a work document greatly exceeds any data recording taken from it. Its creation process, transmission of traditions, economic and social constraints, interpretation practices, emission and reception phenomena, to name just a few. The generation of knowledge begins the minute a work document reaches our hands. Accuracy and flexibility are not an easy pairing to put into practice, but it's crucial when cataloging from hermeneutics because the more is cataloged, the more is learned and the more is understood about what is being catalogued. Cataloging is the epitome of Ars Longa Vita Brevis. And then one single, these are how we sustained and all these, uh, all these inscriptions, you don't understand exactly. That's what the synopsis is for, yeah? The holographs, the autographs, and so forth, yeah? All the notes that contains, okay. And the close. Here is the homogeneity of some parts and where they were apart from this file, from the main file. And now only some, uh, this is a, 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 how do you call that? A second colophon. It's a visual colophon. In 2005, Musicat database system was hatched on the internet. On 2014, volume one of the music catalog created with a database from music art was launched in the internet. In, 20, in 2016, Muscat was just launched on the internet by reason. Do you see any similarities? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 